an interesting thing I think for us to talk about is, uh, you know, we're talking about being a multi instrumentalist, mm -hmm. and inherent in that is having multiple skill sets. Um, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, that extends beyond what instrument that you're playing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or which instruments you play, uh, and also goes into uh, social skills, mm -hmm. um, being able to sell yourself, or to being able to talk about a variety of different topics um, in a way that uh, you know get your get your point across the way you want, but mm -hmm. that's also efficient, effective. Um, uh, I find myself in a lot of meetings, you know. All the time, I'm, meet, I'm meeting all the time. I have regular meetings each week. Um, I just actually got out of a faculty meeting, mm -hmm. school of music faculty meeting, and uh, understanding which hat to wear, how to wear that hat, and how to articulate things in a way that uh, you know make people feel comfortable, um, <laughs> convincing mm -hmm. people, sort of convincing people that it was their idea, although mm -hmm. you know it was your idea. Uh, so that they feel more comfortable getting behind something and all those kinds of things. Do you have some thoughts on that, on those kinds of things? Well, I know a lot of, uh, not just multi-instrumentalists, but anyone who is, uh, who spends a lot of time shedding yep. the social aspect of uh, life tends to get, um, <laughs> it's not, it's just not as strong. So a lot of, a lot of cats that, that, shed all the time which you you have to i think to be good um we are more comfortable by ourselves yeah. <laughs> i mean it's sort of like you you because of the lifestyle you make yourself an introvert yeah um yeah. and i think because of that you know time has to be spent practicing socializing which i think if anyone else who who doesn't uh deal with practicing on that level they're probably hearing this conversation like what are you talking about just go out and hang but if you if your time so where the average person may spend going out to the club or going out with their friends or going to play basketball uh you know our time is probably going to be in the practice room dealing with scales and harmony <laughs> so um you know because of that we just spend a lot of time by ourselves. And so I think those social skills are important to build and you, you have to be a little more intentional about, uh, you know, forcing yourself to acquire that ability. You know? Absolutely. Um, uh, I think a, a fairly common trait of uh, virtuoso musicians, uh, this is who we're talking about, mm -hmm. really have developed uh, their musicianship to a to a really high level. Uh, a common trait is that they are naturally introverted. Yeah. Um, uh, because for the reasons that you said, I mean, uh, it takes somebody uh, the willingness to spend a lot of time with themselves, by mm -hmm. themselves, working on 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 stuff where nobody else is watching. Right. And being okay with that. Um. And uh the that whole the extroverted thing so my wife is an extrovert mm -hmm. um and that works out well for me uh <laughs> because <laughs> because she 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 knows everybody she's got all kinds of friends everybody's her friend um you know i i, I joke about this but you know my wife can get anybody to do anything for no money <laughs> she, just, she just has that yeah has that ability mm -hmm. me not so much mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, I've learned how to develop uh, certain at least on the surface extroverted kinds of qualities and I think that people assume that I'm an extrovert because when they hear me talk about things I'm passionate I have an intensity about what I'm saying uh, but then also uh, the kind of settings that I find myself in you know I'm yeah. playing you know, I'm on stage and thousands of people are in the audience and I feel comfortable. You know, I mm -hmm. seem comfortable. Oh, he's got to be an extrovert then. Yeah. You know, uh, but see, the thing is, and the, the, the way that I, 
uh, tell the difference between somebody that's extroverted and someone that's introverted is um, an introvert can be in front of a lot of people if they don't have to fight for anybody's attention. Mm -hmm. It can actually be rejuvenating. Uh, uh, you know, uh, an introvert is going to be uh, uh, rejuvenated in one-on-one -on -one kinds of settings where there's a there's a direct line between the communication. Yeah, so this kind of, yeah. So this kind of thing for me, this is like super rejuvenating to me. Mm -hmm. This doesn't take anything out. Teaching private lessons, teaching a class, playing in front of in front of a bunch of people, you know, playing in a club or something for three or four hours when people watching you, that's totally rejuvenating. Mm -hmm. But it's completely and totally taxing for me is uh, is social is is social gatherings where I don't know anybody. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, it's funny because, um, you know, you bring up your wife, and that's a good that's a good point because in I hope you don't mind me speaking about her, but in her field of dance, uh, generally it's I'm sure there's time she spends on her own practicing certain skills, right. but it's more of a group. Like she dances with other dancers. Right. And so there's a, a sort of a natural social thing, but you know, to the point we're making, when you're in the practice room, for, you know, I don't know how many hours you may do that on different instruments. You just you're on your own doing that. Yeah. Uh, and that's such a strong point, but I, I I totally feel you on the, uh, on the 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 effort to. Uh, how'd you word it? Compete for attention, or how? Yeah, yeah. How'd you word if I have to, right. If I have to compete for attention, or if I have to, uh, so, so for instance, um, I hate small talk. Yeah. Okay. I can only talk for the weather for so long. Yep. Before I want to start talking about the <laughs> right, right behind the weather. Uh huh. You know, and uh, and a lot of times especially for an initial meeting with somebody you you just meeting the person it's like it can come across as being too intense yeah you know um and so i've had to learn how to be light mm -hmm. um and i'm still not that great at it you know yeah. and i still have to constantly it's not natural for me i still have to really work on that um uh but my wife oh my goodness like uh, it, it's it's one of the greatest things is uh, you know going with her to a social gathering because she sets everything up. Mm -hmm. She does the she does the sort of what would be for me labor intensive small talking, and right. then sets it up so that I can uh, uh, you know end up in situations where I'm really kind of having a having what I consider to be a more meaningful kind of uh, dialogue mm -hmm. you know, communication with somebody. And uh, and then in that way, it ends up uh, being uh, enjoyable, actually. Yeah. You know, I, I remember, uh, you know, uh, growing up and even when, in my college years, um, really, really dreading the thought of even having to go to, uh, you know, any kind of social kind of event that yeah. wasn't, you know, directly related to music, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and it really is a problem because you can't stay there mm -hmm. and be successful, you know. And when I say successful, I'm not just I'm not just measuring how much money, mm -hmm. you know. I'm talking about the quality of the relationships that you develop, the you know, the ability to convince people that uh, what it is that you have to offer is worthy. Yeah, and to have more collaborative opportunities to exchange mm -hmm. information. That's what this is about. That's what that's actually what music is about. Yeah. You know, um, uh, you know, I'm in that Miles Davis movie, uh, Miles Ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, and although I'm not supposed to say that I'm Cannonball, uh, I'm playing the role of Cannonball. Right, 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 right. They didn't get the licensing for that. But uh -huh. <laughs> I'm playing the role of Cannonball. And uh, one thing that... Uh, uh, there's a there's a there's a clip of the movie that's that's circulating, and uh, where Don Cheadle, who is Miles Davis, mm -hmm. um, he says, you know, don't call it jazz. He says, call it social music. Mm -hmm. 
um, because it is social music. The, 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 the music, the tradition of this music, uh, you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in a band setting at least. And more than that, uh, uh, interacting with the audience. And it's yeah. not just interacting uh, with the audience from the bandstand. Mm -hmm. It's actually on the breaks out in the audience you know, communicating, developing relationship with your constituency. There's a, yeah. there's a, uh, I hate to say this, but there's a political component uh, to being a successful musician. Yeah. Um, uh, now back to what we were talking about before, uh, about the sort of skills necessary to, uh, you know, to develop as far as, you know, being in meetings and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, what are some what are some uh, things that you felt like you've had to develop uh, in order to have uh, good, a good experience and having have good outcomes um, in some of the meetings, even that you were in last week? Yeah, a lot of it for me is a struggle for um, singular focus. Yeah. Um, I think, and this is something I've I've learned about myself over the years um there is a way that my brain and i'm sure yours or maybe others functions from a musical standpoint to where i'm on the bandstand I'm, i can focus on 10 different things at once i'm hearing what the bass was playing i'm reacting to him i'm reacting to the drummer i'm reacting to the horn player I'm, or whatever instrument playing and you're because your ears and your attention is so divided uh that's a skill that I've developed on the bandstand that helps me to be uh, a better musician. But when that same mindset is in a meeting, I'm folk, I'm, my focus is everywhere. I'm paying attention to what you're wearing. I'm paying attention to your body language. I'm paying attention to what type of sense of humor you have. I, while I'm trying to pay attention to what you're saying um, and trying to creatively think about whatever the subject matter is in the meeting. Um, I just, that's, that's, it's, it's sort of like, you, you go, I mean, it's a pro and con. Um, and I've learned that where it's a pro for me is when I'm in musical situations, being able to focus on all those things, even focus on tones, EQ, focus on like the more you learn about the sonics and all that stuff in the studio or whatever you are, um, y your mind is is focusing on a lot more things that on just the basis of being able to hear everyone hears it but they're not paying attention to it yeah so and you, it's like someone to you you hear that feedback it's like no and then listen listen you hear it now and then when they're paying attention to it they hear it but you have to be trained to do that and so uh <laughs> I'm starting to digress. I don't want to, get, but basically, you know, for me, singular focus, which for a lot of people, like my sister, who's an attorney, that's easy for her. Like she's so like laser beam thinking about the next thing and it's just, she's on it. But for me, and I think artsy people in general, I think it's that left brain, right thing, like left brain, right brain thing. I heard, um, you know, it, it's hard to stay on a singular, at least for me, to stay on a singular focus um, because my mind is so divided. And I leave those meetings sometimes more fatigued mentally than everyone else who's not a musician. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a different. It's it's a different way to uh, to focus. You know, I think the way that I've tried to deal with this. Um, and you know, we're all work in progress. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, all the stuff that we're talking about, this is just, you know, this is just our ideas about it, our, our, uh, particular angle on, on things. So, you know, anybody watching these videos should never feel like, you know, we, we think that we're right about everything, but mm -hmm. it's just our thoughts, you know, on these topics. Oh, but I'm right though. Uh, no. that's right. <laughs> I am too, but. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you have to contextualize, you know. Right, 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 right. For okay. those that don't know, don't understand. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I have a lot of stuff going on in my life. Um, you know, I've got a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, married, obviously. Uh, got a dog. You know, I play all these instruments, music. You know, I'm a music professor. Uh, I work at a church um, where I had different kinds of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm in a lot of meetings. Um, I'm, you know, teaching classes, directing ensembles, writing music. You know, there's all these different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an amateur bodybuilder. Um, all the stuff that, 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 that's going on. And what I've tried to develop, um, and I'm still working on it, I feel like I've, I've gotten better at this, is I try to use each different thing that I do as a way to take a pause or take a rest from other stuff that I do. Mm. Mm. Um, I think an easy thing to do, a natural thing to do, is to sort of carry everything with us. So you carry everything with you into every situation. You have like kind of all this baggage. Um, and so it makes it hard to give 100% towards whatever the new thing is that you're doing mm -hmm. or whatever the, th the task at hand because you're in your brain, you're thinking about all these other things that are going on. Now, yeah, uh, you know, your subconscious is going to, is, you're going to be thinking about certain things, but certainly uh, we can try to develop a, uh, an ability to, uh, to focus enough on the thing at the task at hand uh, in a way that allows us to take a break from other stuff that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So then when we get back to the other stuff that we're doing, it's like we're fresh. Mm -hmm. we, we haven't been really thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the way that I've done this is uh, by the way that I uh, set up my schedule. So I have like, you know, lists of things that I have to do, but having lists of things that you have to do, but then no sort of scheduled time to address those things is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Because you never get, you never get anything happening. You never think, get anything going. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you feel like you have even more things and then you didn't really ever address anything mm -hmm. at least to, to your own satisfaction. Um, so what I've tried to do, and I'm constantly tweaking this, is I've tried to figure out how much time it takes me to do certain kinds of things. So I know it takes me a couple hours to go to the gym. I take my son with me. So that's part of that whole package of time. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I take a shower at the gym so that that's, that's also wrapped up into how much time it takes. The gym that I usually go to is only about five minutes away from my house. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I I, so I've, I've figured out all of these sort of details. Um, and, and so whenever I go to the gym, I figure I need like a two and a half hour block. Mm -hmm. Whenever I'm practicing a certain kind of thing. And this goes anything from like really small stuff to like bigger stuff, but mm -hmm. I know that it takes me like um, I can learn pretty much any two five one or a giant step substitution or any line or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I can I can learn to play it in all keys in about ten minutes, ten to fifteen mm -hmm. minutes, and get proficient with it. Yeah. So in my practice routine, I know that this is the amount of time I need for that. So I need to at least allot that. Plus, I need to allot enough time to review something else. So, okay, so that means that that slot's going to be like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at, it, when, when, when my timer dings at 30 minutes, <clears throat> um, I will feel like I accomplished something because I gave myself enough time to be able to address the stuff. Right. And now, it didn't start out that way. It started out by me either um, underestimating how much time, usually underestimating because I try to push myself. Uh -huh. you know, and because I'm impatient. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just impatient. I, yeah. Hey, man, I ought to be able to do this right now. What's uh -huh. going on? Yep. On. You know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I, that's what's in my head. But I've learned how to say, okay, you can, you can use that intensity and energy, but you just have to give yourself enough time to, to deal with it. But what I've tried to do, and I think I've used 
uh, a lot of the time that I'm in the gym, uh, the way that I train, the, my knowledge of how much time it takes and timing the rests and stuff, and then also all the time in the practice room and figuring out and just kind of self-discovering, figuring out how much time it takes me to do stuff. And I've allowed that to sort of inform a lot of other things that I'm doing. Sure. And so now the way that my schedule was laid out, um, I, I, I try to let, let that sort of tell me when it's time to go start doing the next thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, I have a, a student, um, actually we've been doing Skype lessons for, uh, for a while. And um, him and I have like similar disposition with like just being like, like impatient with ourselves and, and, you know, and getting to the next level. One of the mistakes I think musicians make uh, people that are really intense and, and they're this kind of virtuoso types that really want to develop their musicianship to the, you know, to the next level Mm -hmm. is a lot of times we lack these sort of, ability to establish a baseline of uh, proficiency before we go to the next thing. So, for instance, um, if I learn a 2-5-1 in all keys and I can play it at quarter note equals 120 um, proficiently, then That's actually the measurement that I use to say, okay, it's time for me to go to something else. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that I set set the time at the the temple at 120 is because in my head, I want to be able to play that thing at like 400. Mm -hmm. You know? (laughs) Yeah. So then it's like, if I can't play it at 400, then it's easy to get stuck just playing that same thing over and over and over. And the problem is, is at some point you stop actually gaining anything from it. And you also don't, you're, you don't allow yourself to move on to something else, which actually would be much more beneficial. Right. Like when are you going to actually use that line at 400? Mm-hmm. You're probably never going to play it at 400. <laughs> you know, oh, but when I do, I'm going to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have, some, you have some, I've been talking for a while. You, you have some thoughts on that? Well, I think it, it's yeah, what you're talking about requires big picture practicing yeah. and big picture mentality when you approach your pr- practicing and probably about, um, I'll say three years ago, I started keeping a journal. I probably should have done it years before, but just really being uh, intentional about my journaling, my practicing and um, uh, documenting so I can so you sort of it allows you to keep analytics it's good teaching yeah come on don't let me preach now <laughs> but uh <laughs> um but yeah it's 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 really allows you to keep analytics and then over a month's time you can look back over what you've done and analyze you know i've got this down i now I need to get this down and then sometimes it takes you sitting with a journal without an instrument and planning yeah. what you need to get together it's good teaching uh Come on now. You can send your offering to, no, um, <laughs> probably 1995. <laughs> no, nah, but um, y- you, you start to realize. I got a prayer cloth for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll send you a practice cloth. Um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, but um, <laughs> no, nah, but you, you start to, uh, you made me lose my thought, man. Uh, you start, you start to uh, realize. Oh, I'm sorry. You you need to sit by yourself without the instrument and um, evaluate where you suck. You know the areas that you're not strong in. Uh, whether whether it's articulation, whether it's vocabulary, whether it's uh, dexterity or rhythm or feel. You know you have to pay attention while you're playing. And say, okay, I need to write. I need to. I need to focus on that. I need. I need to get that together. And then sometimes on the gig, between songs, have have uh, um, your notebook, or if you keep your notes in the phone like I do, have that nearby so you can just write. Oh, I need to deal with that. Get back on the gig next song. But start to evaluate yourself uh, on that level, and then 
you know, attack it. Attack each area. If you're if you're weak, uh, if your dexterity is not strong, your facility is not strong, deal with that. If your harmony is questionable, if you're not really hearing changes or hitting changes the way you want to, write that down and then systematically develop an approach. That's the type of stuff I did not do when I was younger that I wish I would have. I probably, I, would, I know I would be in a totally different uh, place musically had I looked at things more in, in a more organized fashion. But a lot of cats don't do that because, man, we just want to play. And I understand that. I mean, clearly, that's, you know, I just wanted to play. But now that I'm looking back, if there is a piece of uh, advice I would give somebody, you know, younger than me, um, I would definitely say that. Like, approach your practicing in a very systematic way. Uh, and then, you know, some days you just want to play, and that's fine. Like, you know, don't make every day a, a chore and a, practice, a, a bear because then you're not going to practice at all. But definitely have as many planned days, as many um, days where you, where you deal with the instrument or the concept in a systematic way. And then you can actually analytically look in your journal and say, oh, I accomplished this in two months. I accomplished this or I need to accomplish it in two months yeah. and have those goals. Yeah, that's good. That's good teaching, man. Um, I, uh, everything that you're saying is stuff that I talk to my students about. Um, uh, <clears throat> I talk about the five tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first tool is chromatic tuner. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason uh, for practicing with a chromatic tuner, all of these are mirrors. Mm -hmm. They're reflecting back to you where you actually are, who you actually are as a musician where you're strong, where you're weak as a musician. Um, since uh, even people with perfect pitch can play out of tune mm -hmm. and they can have certain tendencies. Uh, I had a student with perfect pitch and he had certain intonation issues and we addressed those. Yeah. Um, so, so perfect pitch is not, does not mean that you don't need a tuner. As a matter of fact, if you were born with perfect pitch in India, then... <laughs> Then, then your sense of perfect pitch would be calibrated based on what the common right. know, scale and the common tuning system is. Mm -hmm. So it can be calibrated. So a, a chromatic tuner is important. Uh, number two is a metronome. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's very easy to tell when you get in, in a band situation who practices with a metronome and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea here is that if everybody practices with a metronome, then when you get together, then you're really going to be able to agree. Right. Okay. Um, and now understand that practicing with a metronome does not necessarily mean using a literal metronome. It could be playing with, uh, you know, could be practicing with tracks. Mm -hmm. It could be practicing with recordings. All of those, all of those things would satisfy that same thing. Well, it forces you to listen to someone else besides your own timing. That's right. That's right. Also, practicing with a metronome doesn't have to be just practicing with the metronome on every beat of the measure. Mm -hmm. Practice with the metronome on beat two and four of the measure. Mm -hmm. Practice with the metronome every other measure on beat four. Yeah. Practice with the metronome every four measures on, on the end of one. Mm -hmm. Can you make that stuff line up? Mm-hmm how solid is your sense of time? Yeah. You know, so uh, all of these things are mirrors. Number three is a, is a digital recorder. And uh, th there's a story I tell about John Coltrane. Uh, I'm going to try not to go real deep into train this time. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Break out the Kleenexes and the, and the yeah. violins. <laughs> man, Coltrane, man. <laughs> uh, Coltrane ruined me for everybody else. But right. I can't enjoy any of the music. I was like, right. <laughs> no, uh, Coltrane, between when he left Miles' band and he was playing with Monk uh, and he signed a, co a contract with uh, Prestige Records, he was there for a couple years and then he returned to Miles Davis' uh, band. During that time period, that two-year time period, he, it was some of his most uh, profitable practicing. Mm 
And, uh, and part of it was because, and, and part of the reason why he wanted to sign this contract with Prestige is because they would let him record as much as he wanted. Mm. And matter of fact, I have a box set, 16 CDs of material that he put out in that two year period of time, 16 CDs. Now, Train was, was shedding all kind of crazy hours. Mm-hmm. But his, his practicing was informed by direct feedback he was getting from these recordings. Mm-hmm. He knew that the more he listened to himself, the better that he would be, the, mo- mm-hmm. the closer to where he was trying to get to he could get. Right. And so by listening, so by being able to record 16 c- CDs worth of, worth of material, that meant that he was able to hear 16 mm-hmm. CDs worth of material in that two-year period of time and yep. make refinements and adjustments to what, was, uh, what, what he was doing. So <clears throat> recording ourselves. Now, we don't have any excuse these days. Our phones will even generate really good recordings. Yeah. So my suggestion is that people record all of their lessons. If they're taking lessons with people. They should record them. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, I, I actually record in, you know, I'm, just, I'm working on my doctorate, uh, University of Cincinnati, and I was recording all my lectures. Yeah. You know, so I could listen to them. I was listening. I was recording my saxophone lesson. Mm-hmm. I was recording um, rehearsals. You know, record every performance. You know, and so then I have a, an incredible library of my my own playing. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people, you know, if you don't like what you sound like, then what are you doing about it? And I'm going to say something, and this is going to sound, you know, <laughs> this might sound crazy. But I like what I sound like. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't like what I sound like. I, 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 now, that's not the same as me saying that I'm perfect mm-hmm. or that I, I have nothing to work on. But the reason I like what I sound like is because I've been listening to myself over and over and making refinements. Yep. And none of this stuff is in a vacuum. I'm not even claiming that all of my ideas come from me. <laughs> I'm not cl- actually. I'm claiming. I'm not claiming any of my ideas. Yeah, all I've done is is has been a big open receptor of all of the all the stuff in the universe that I can receive. Sure, sure. Find ways to to make that stuff agree with my personality. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, digital recorder is important. Number four is a practice log. Yeah. So that's that's what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, keeping uh, keeping track of what you're doing. Because if you if you don't keep track of what you're doing, you, you have no basis for for which to tell if you've you know if you're achieving your goals, is, is everything going well or not? What you know you you have no idea. Plus, you know, three years from now, you have no idea of what you were practicing. So as a teacher, it's beneficial also to keep track of that stuff so that when you're trying to tell somebody else what it is that you practice to get a certain thing in your playing, you'll be able to give them specifics right, on what right. it is that you were practicing. Not just kind of some abstract general. What you checking out? Ah, oh, man, you know, I just, <laughs> listen, I check out everybody, man. You know, I'm just, I'm just open. Yeah, I love all music. All yeah. Music. <laughs> I love all music. <laughs> all music and everybody that plays it. That's right, that's right, man. You know, I'm just, I'm just open, you know, I'm just yeah. <laughs> or, or or the cats that'll just tell you that they don't practice. All right, right. I just live life, man, and let the life come through my music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Get out of here with that crap. <laughs> uh, and then number five is a timer. Yeah. And uh, the timer idea comes from, uh, actually comes from the early church practice of um, uh, uh Praying without ceasing, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, and praying without ceasing in particular was the use of the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm-hmm. And it was repeated over and over as a mantra mm-hmm. to the point where a monastic could be talking to you and also in their mind, this prayer is constantly, is constantly happening. Mm. And uh, it comes, so, so the timer uh, in particular, the way to document and to keep how, track of how many times that prayer was recited 
um, uh, were used either prayer beads, like in the in the Roman Catholic tradition, mm -hmm. or uh, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, uh, 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 a, a prayer rope, which mm. has a number of knots on it. And then you don't actually have to look at the knots because there's a marker on the prayer rope that tells you when you've got to 30 or 50, mm. or 50 times mm. through a particular prayer. So a monastic can walk around and in their hand, they're doing this, moving to the next beat every time they've recited the, the Jesus prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, this is great because it allows you to stay completely dialed in and focused, but then also keep track of how many times mm -hmm. you've gone through that. So what a timer does is a timer uh, makes it so that you don't have to look at anything to verify your time, right. how much time you've been practicing. Right. Set it to 30 minutes, and it will tell me when 30 minutes is over. Yep. Uh, because being uh, focused, you know, it, 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 as soon as we start doing something else or get distracted by something, um, it takes it takes a few minutes to dial back into that really right that really clear focus. Mm -hmm. You were you were talking about something about evaluating pers personal evaluation, saying, "Hey, I'm not very good at playing chord changes, or or my digital dexterity is not together, or." I need to work on my intonation or my sense of time is not happening. And um, what I'm actually right now, what I'm developing is a way for my students to, to, to figure that stuff out in a more objective manner. Mm -hmm. So the way this is going to work is uh, there'll be a list of things, not unlike the list that you presented. And then uh, a, 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 a list of categories, a list of musicianship attributes and then they will evaluate themselves from zero to ten, mm -hmm. ten being the highest. Then I will evaluate them from zero to ten in each category. Mm -hmm. And then in our studio class, the the studio, the saxophone studio, about fifteen saxophone players, they will evaluate them mm -hmm. from zero to ten, what they think. I'll take an average of the numbers that they come up with and then we'll have three streams. Then yeah. I'll average those streams together, and then you'll end up with something that's much more objective, mm. much more coherent to reality. Because I think a lot of times, uh, it's, it's that old thing, you know, knowing yourself. Uh, yeah. Knowing yourself is one of the hardest things to do. It seems like it's easy, even for people that spend all this time by themselves, like we do, mm -hmm. practicing. Um, it's so hard to really know yourself and you can't see yourself even looking in a mirror, even practicing with a metronome, even practicing with a chromatic tuner. Yes, that stuff helps, but you can't actually see yourself. So you have to be willing to open yourself up to other people speaking to you and saying, mm -hmm. look, man, this is killing about your playing. You're spending an hour, you know, each day, working on all this digital dexterity stuff, but you spend like very little time on refining your, your, your pitch, your sense of pitch. Yeah. I mean, you still have certain intonation issues and I noticed in your practice log, you spend in 10 minutes, five minutes practicing with the match with, with, with the chromatic tuner, but yeah. you spend in an hour on all this digital dexterity stuff. And man, you like naturally have a lot of digital dexterity. Mm -hmm. But that's but you don't play in tune. <laughs> but you don't play in tune, right? Yeah. So let's re let's reevaluate that. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 have you, and that's that's um, that's that's what a teacher is supposed to provide for a student. Yeah. Is is some of that? Look, I see you in a way that you can't see yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a lot of folks they're not responsive to that. Yeah. They they, they just they reject anybody. Mm -hmm. talking to them or saying things to them. Um, I got this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as a multi-instrumentalist, um, I think having that willingness to be open to what other people say to you, I think is maybe even more important mm -hmm. um, because uh, none, of us, uh, none of us can know as much about every instrument. Yeah. You know, and so we have to be willing to listen to other people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I remember, you probably remember this. 
um, I called you, this was some years ago, uh, and I was asking you about being able to get more gigs playing bass or something, mm -hmm. or, or guitar or something. I can't remember what, what, what the topic was. And I asked you to, and then also when, when uh, I brought you to the church I work at, and you were playing drums and I was playing bass, and I asked you to give me an evaluation of my playing, and you gave yep. me, you know, and, and that opened you up to be able to actually tell me what you thought. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that, by the way. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the kind of thing that I think people have to be willing to do. Well, it also takes, it takes the wisdom to be able to ask. Because honestly, you know, a lot of times, I'm not just going to, give somebody an opinion since we walk up the band saying, hey man, great job. You need to work on your time. <laughs> you know, who, who does that? So, right. you know, by wisdom, the, <laughs> the older I'm getting, I'm just learning, just ask, hey man, you think that was cool? And I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not fishing for, fishing for compliments. You fish for, <laughs> you know, hey, was that cool? You know, because that's the whole insecurity thing, which is the whole another musician oh, no, man. thing you see now that's that yeah well that's a whole that we'll have another conversation about that, that but preach yeah <laughs> <laughs> fishing for criticisms uh and you know some criticisms you, you may say actually that's where i want to go but at least you ask at least you find out right. so you yeah. know <laughs> you stupid. <laughs> that will preach. Uh -huh. <laughs> and for nine ninety five, I'll send you my practice cloth. <laughs> Place this cloth in your case. <laughs> Man. Uh, I go straight to hell for that one. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, no, man. Um, yeah, you know, it's always great talking, man. Uh, and... Uh, you know, we just want we want people to to uh, condi continue to develop as as musicians, and uh, in particular, obviously, our, our focus topic here is, yeah. is 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 we're trying to be more catered to multi instrumentalists and and helping them to get to the next to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think that's a good session. So let's uh, yeah, let's let's box that one up. Cool, cool. <laughs>